And our next speaker is my good old friend, <laughs> Danilo. So uh, Danilo is a tech evangelist for serverless, and he'll be uh, delivering the second part of the story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, so I'll leave you to it. Yeah, I was good enough to split the content with Rick, so I'm doing the stuff that I like. Yeah, <laughs> the really cool stuff. So, and Thank you. Uh, we, unfortunately, we can't dive deep into everything today because we had, as you had, uh, as having today, 100 announcements, so we are trying to understand everything. So for every question we can answer, we're happy to come back. So uh, this part was in Werner keynote. Uh, and Werner is always talking uh, about how we can improve the, the development and the development experience on AWS. So his idea is, what are we getting as a feedback from developers? Uh, uh, this is four things where every developer is usually, uh, as, where every developer usually has strong opinions. So how they develop, if they use an integrated development environment, which languages they want to use, which is the programming model they want to apply, and workflows, so how you can create and manage a, a complex workflow. Uh, for the IDEs, uh, we launched last year at reInvent Cloud9, is a web-based uh, uh, integrated development environment. It's something we are working on, we are adding features, and we think that for cloud-based development is probably the best choice. But this is an opinion. This is something that every developer has their own opinion on, in, uh, on how they want to develop. So this year we launched uh, these three new toolkits uh, that you can use, and they are initially focused on serverless development, but we are planning to add more features. So the uh, to AWS toolkit for PyCharm is generally available, so you can just install it from the PyCharm uh, marketplace. Uh, those for IntelliJ and VS Code are in preview, so uh, in a blog post, we have the GitHub repo where we are uh, working on those. All, all three of them are open source. And uh, for IntelliJ and VS Code, you can go to the repo if you want to test them and also if you want to provide your feedback during the development. Uh, as you know, uh, IntelliJ is the core between PyCharm and IntelliJ. So uh, all the, the features that are not language specific for PyCharm are already available for IntelliJ. Everything that is Python specific works only for PyCharm now. And uh, for VS Code, uh, we, we probably see people using that mostly for JavaScript and type, uh, TypeScript, so that's where we are uh, trying to focus development. What, what are the features of the So the, the, they are focused on serverless development. Uh, they uh, use the uh, AWS SAM CLI for, uh, uh, to enable also the local execution of serverless applications. So from uh, one of the, from PyCharm, that is the, you can create a serverless application. We provide some tem a few templates, and we are adding more templates, uh, and we create all the scaffolding for you. Uh, so the template, the same template describing the, inf the architecture. We are providing starting code for uh, your Python function, uh, and then you can uh, run the function locally to test how it works. You can debug the function locally with the PyCharm debugger. And then you can deploy the serverless application to the cloud. And then you can run the function remotely and compare uh, the results. There's lots of small details. Like, for example, if you do local exec execution, you can pass a region and parameters that we use for the AWS services that you use within the function. So, for example, if your function is calling DynamoDB, you can still debug locally. And then we will do the remote call to uh, DynamoDB if they are in the steps uh, using the credentials that you provide. So you can really emulate a complex function uh, and uh, calling other AWS services uh, locally. So it doesn't run any of the AWS stuff in, on your local host? It doesn't run your local Dynamo SMS? So it doesn't run local. Uh, the only thing that is emulated locally is, the, is Lambda uh, for now. Uh, the same CLI that we're using for this, they also can emulate the API gateway, but this is not enabled yet in, uh, in, in PyCharm. But I think, uh, 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 using the AWS services as a step makes sense because you, you don't want to debug inside uh, the, the call. You can still go step by step in your function, even if you're calling uh, SQS, if you're calling DynamoDB, uh, everything will be executed locally with the remote calls, and you can provide credentials with the right uh, privilege, the same that you would give to the Lambda function. So we, we 
exactly. So for uh, uh, using different endpoints than than those that are uh, in the in, in your production environment, you probably use parameters with your lambda function, uh, and the parameters are part of the configuration. So you can have a setup uh, PyCharm like all IntelliJ toolkit. Uh, IDEs, they have the concept of configuration to launch and, and for debugging, and you can set up parameters once where you set when I want to do the local debugging, use this, SQ, uh, the parameter SQSQ goes to this test queue. Uh, and in this, in this way, you can use a different queue, uh, and you have to configure this only once, and then every time you debug, you are using the, the, a different queue. So I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a nice setup. Uh, for like, uh, the only thing that you can emulate locally is, is DynamoDB. Uh, uh, technically, you can do that, but it's not out of, uh, out of the box with, uh, with the toolkit. And I would not do that unless really uh, uh, there is a need, because in my view, we are used to develop locally because production was too expensive. Now you have the luxury of using exactly the same uh, technology uh, that you will use in production for development. Uh, but what you miss is the bugging, the possibility to go step by step in the Lambda function. That's what we are providing, the possibility to see how the logic in your Lambda function works uh, uh, across multiple AWS services. If, if I start answering a question and you don't he uh, hear the question, stop me because sometimes I forget to repeat the question. Sorry. So this was uh, the first announcement in the, in the serverless section. Uh, and then we start to talk about languages. Languages is something where we are, everybody is opinionated, everybody has their favorite language. Uh, those are the runtimes that we support now, so not JS, Python, Java, and everything running on the JVM 8, uh, .NET Core, uh, Go, uh, I don't remember what, what? Ah, <laughs> and, uh, and then we, uh, we added support for Ruby, so uh, now there's full support for Ruby 2.5. Uh, sorry, I, actually I'm a little bit sick, but, uh, <laughs> so I'm like not 100% tonight. But, so the, this we had, we added support for uh, Ruby, and so Ruby 2.5, uh, and though all of these are fully managed runtimes uh, that we handle for you. So as you know, you can specify high level version, and then we do the minor updates transparent for you for security patches and things like that. Then we added a possibility to use custom runtimes, and this works using a, a new runtime API uh, that we defined. Uh, there is a way to describe the way your code that can run with any language at this point communicates with the Lambda execution environment. Uh, and if there is time, I will do a, a demo of how that works. Uh, but the idea is that few people are interested in the details of the runtime API. We expect people to create runtimes so that developers then can use those runtimes to uh, use their favorite languages. And actually on day one, when we launched this feature, we released two open source runtimes for C++ and Rust, and they are available on GitHub. And we also work with our partners to develop uh, other uh, and support other runtimes. Some of these are open source, some others are proprietary solutions. Uh, so uh, uh, with Alert Logic, we work to provide Erlang and Elixir, uh, and, and they are open source actually on GitHub. Uh, Stackery is also working open source on GitHub for a PHP runtime. I think this was one of the most re requested together with Ruby. Uh, and then uh, Node Source is providing a, a runtime for NSolid, their robust uh, Node.js distribution. And Blue Age is working for COBOL. And one of the customers on stage that is working for a bank uh, uh, actually mentioned the fact that it could be interesting to migrate, not jump from the mind frame or to, to serverless when you migrate to, uh, to the cloud. Any question on this? Yeah? So we don't disclose that. Uh, so we don't <laughs> disclose that. So the, 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 the question was which uh, language has the largest footprint? So we, we don't, uh, I don't, we never disclose that, that information. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, Node.js is very popular for web development and mobile backends, Python for uh, data analytics, and you, uh, you, you will see that it's now much easier also with a new feature that I still didn't talk about. Java and .NET, it's certainly used in enterprise context depending if the company is on one side or the other. Uh, Go is, is growing a lot. Go is growing a lot, also in the enterprise space. And it's, uh, it's also a very fast run, uh, run time. So if you 
uh, uh, want to try something new uh, and you're a, a startup or a, an enterprise, Go can be a good, a good choice. For example, at reInvent, I was having a session with Capital One. Uh, they use Lambda for one of the very few public API that they have to uh, advertise credit cards and to regist start the registration process for the new customer of our credit card. So you can imagine uh, how critical are those APIs. They run on Lambda and they started with Java and then they moved to Go. Uh, first because they want to put more energy in the team and, and try something different. And, uh, and also they notice that it's much faster uh, also for Costa. So uh, there, there is not a specific number, but they're all being used slightly differently. And now we've seen lots of interest in Ruby, especially if you use Sinatra, for example, it can be a good way with uh, 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 my colleague, Alex Wood, that is working in the SK, SDK team, already released a framework where you can uh, embed a Sinatra uh, application. Sinatra is a mi micro framework for Ruby, uh, very much used. Uh, so you can easily migrate a Sinatra uh, application into, into Lambda. So this was, I think, one of the interesting announcements, but the question would be, okay, how can you distribute these runtimes? Normally you need to embed all the code with your Lambda function, so if you have to use a runtime, it's just making function more complex to deploy. And that's why we uh, developed also this new feature, and this is probably my top favorite feature for reInvent, it's the Lambda layers. And the idea is that we, we've seen lots of customers that when they create Lambda function, ideally a Lambda function has a narrow scope, you know, should for, uh, solve only some specific business problem, and, uh, and you need to con use some uh, standard libraries, uh, and those standard libraries must, must be embedded w when you create the function and with each deployment. So you maybe have 10K of uh, business logic, and then you have 100 megabytes of libraries, and every time you have to deploy, you need to upload everything uh, slowing down also the deployment and making the deployment more complex. So with layers, you can create a layer uh, for uh, each dependency bundle that you want to uh, use with your functions, and then you can connect the, the, the function in the configuration of the function with one or more layers. Uh, you can connect up to five layers to a function, so you shouldn't think of layers as small packages for every NPM module, for example, but should be bundle of uh, dependencies. Uh, and in this way, uh, we think it will be easier for developers to focus on the business logic because they just need to connect to the layers and they only have to write probably one or very few uh, source code files in the function. And we also are making the speed up of deployment much faster. Uh, because you now need to deploy only the, 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 the few bytes, the few kilobytes of your business logic. Uh, and we think also for enterprises it will be easier to manage dependencies. So from a security perspective, we know what happened a couple of weeks ago with NPM. Uh, dependencies is where it's critical to, to be secure. So in this way, you can have a policy where uh, your layers are where your dependencies are. And, 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 and you can inspect as a company and, and release layers that then developers can use that are uh, proved to be uh, secure and can be updated. Layers have the concept of versions that are immutable, so you can roll out a new version when you, when you need to update, for example, uh, some, uh, some of the dependencies. And one of the, there are, layers can be private in your account, so you can have your own private layers, can be shared across accounts and can also make, make made public and there, there are also AWS managed layers. Uh, for now, there is only one. The first one that we release is for Python, for NumPy and SciPy. Those are two very common uh, mathematical libraries that are used to do, uh, for example, uh, analytics and machine learning. And they are very complex to, to bundle with Lambda functions because they have binary dependencies. So normally you need to import the, num the Python modules. You need to bring some uh, shared objects that are used for low-level C++ uh, uh, computation. Uh, so with that, uh, we, we, did, we already did uh, everything for you. So if you create a function, you can just add this layer and then you can start using NumPy and, some, and CPy uh, very easily. And we're looking forward for suggestion of what could be the standard modules for each platform, for each runtime uh, that, that we must support. And a layer can also bring a runtime. So you can distribute a custom runtime as a layer. So if you create the, if you want to use the PHP uh, runtime, you can create a layer and then share the layer across the company, for example. And then if you update the layer, people cannot do that, just an update. 
So layers are not changing the maximum size of a lambda function. It's, uh, so you can not create bigger lambda functions now because the maximum size of the uncompressed layers and the uncompressed uh, code of the function is still the same. And if you want $50 <laughs> of promotional credit, my question is, uh, what is the maximum size of a, a, a maximum uncompressed size of a lambda function? You already had one, so it seems a little bit too much. 4K? No, it's much. 100? 250. 250, who said 250? I think it's 256, actually, because what, that's on the back, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, so 256 is the uh, current uh, limit. You're welcome. Congratulations. Congratulations. So this, I hope to do a demo of layers and runtimes. And then another announcement that I think was interesting, it was, I think it has great implications, but it will take time, is that now when uh, uh, you can uh, change the way you use the serverless application repository. So the, the serverless application repository is a way to share application publicly or privately in your account using SAM, so you describe your application with a SAM template, you package, and then you put into it into the repository, and then you can share it. Normally, this works for single applications, but people want to use these applications together, and now you can use nested application with the, the serverless application repository. And this has a, a, a large implication, because now we expect people to upload uh, applications that can really be used together. So we, as a prototype, we, we created an application that is uh, solving some common use case. So lots of the times we are looking at social media, for example, at Twitter, and if something happens on Twitter, we want to react and do something. That mm -hmm. depends on our business logic. Maybe we want to store the tweets because it's something that you want to analyze with uh, sentiment analysis. Maybe we want to do an automatic response. Uh, so we created a, a sample application that is uh, uh, is getting an input the string to search on Twitter and the Twitter credentials. And then this can be nested inside an, any other application. So if you want to build now a serverless application that is looking for Twitter and if there is some mention of your company of some hashtag is doing some analytics, you can just in the serverless application uh, template say use this application and if the output of this application is triggering this lambda function and you just write the lambda function. And in this way, you create an application that is sitting on top of this that we already distributed. And we are going, our, our intention is to see if people will start to create these uh, components as that people can use to assemble a serverless application uh, in an easier way. So this is quite powerful. And if you want just to test it, we have this Twitter use case. It's, it's on GitHub and you can use it. And we also launched uh, ALB, so the ALB, the application load balancer, is normally used to balance traffic for EC2 instances or containers. Now it can also balance traffic for uh, AWS Lambda. So you are not forced to use the API gateway to have a, an HTTP interface. You can use uh, the ALB. And we see two kinds of advantages here. So if you have a high volume Lambda function, and you only use a very small subset of the features of the API gateway. The API gateway can be expensive because it provides so many features, but maybe you just need an HTTP interface. And uh, so this, the, the application load balancer can be cheaper at high throughput. And the second benefit is that if you are a company, probably for security reason, it's much easier to, to plug the Lambda function with an ALB because then you have security groups and VPC, so it's much uh, easier to uh, to, to follow this route, and can also be easier if you want to do a migration. So if you have a software running on uh, uh, EC2, for example, and you want to migrate to Lambda, you can plan a migration that is completely transparent for the rest of, the, your, or your, of your infrastructure. So this is uh, a quite interesting use case, and this has also connection with other announcements. For example, the global accelerator that I, we mentioned at the beginning can distribute traffic in one or more region, and one of the endpoints can be uh, the, uh, the ELB. So the idea is that if you want to create a multi-region application with Lambda, now it's much easier because you create Lambda functions in multiple regions uh, with the ALB and then uh, the global uh, accelerator is just giving you a single global IP address that is distributed across multiple regions with high availability uh, uh, and failover. 
For the uh, Amazon API Gateway, we pre-announced this feature that is still not available. Uh, that is the support of WebSockets. So WebSockets provide bi-directional communication on top of the HTTP protocol. And uh, the idea of how this works is that the client, like mobile apps, uh, web application, can create a WebSocket with the Amazon API Gateway, and he, this is a stateful connection. But on the back end, the API Gateway can call Lambda function or Kinesis or any HTTP private or public endpoint that you want. But this is managed uh, 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 without a stateful connection because what happens is that we provide you a callback endpoint. So when we receive a message, we send you a message, and if you want to send a message back, you can use the callback that we provide to send messages back uh, through the WebSocket. So it should uh, make the creation of more interactive applications through the API Gateway much easier to do, and it's something that lots of customers are looking forward. What's that feature using uh, IoT? IoT? An ALB. So the Amazon API Gateway is, uh, is different than ALB because the Amazon API Gateway is uh, taking an HTTP request, is managing things like uh, throttling, is managing things like uh, different layers with, uh, uh, is, is designed not for a web traffic but for API traffic. So lots of features uh, that are typical of an, of an API. Uh, but normally when you create an API backend, you also want to have a bidirectional communication so this solves that, that problem for more advanced use cases. The chat is probably the basic use case but it gives you an idea of when uh, receiving a feedback is useful. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it doesn't need to be running. Otherwise, it would be uh, highly inefficient, no, and, and it wouldn't be, you just put an EC2 instance. So, it, uh, the Lambda fa so what happens is that we give you uh, a callback uh, that you will need to store in some way, and then you can use that callback to send messages back. I don't have all the details because it's not public, and, uh, it, and it's actually not something that I was playing with before reInvent, so uh, I know only the high-level scenario, but it's designed like that. Another uh, announcement in, uh, is workflows, so the last of the four pillar. So we have like 20 s workflow systems in Amazon because how to organize the, the business logic and coordinate multiple things working together is another thing where developers are highly opinionated. Uh, in AWS we have two, no, because we have the simple workflow and then a couple of years ago we launched Stamp Functions that is much easier to use uh, and it's designed more for uh, traditionally serverless workflows. workflows. And we now natively integrated step functions that normally could run lambda functions or activities that normally run on EC2 or, or containers. Now they can directly interact with lots of uh, other AWS services like batch. AWS batch is a service to run batch workloads. Uh, uh, ECS uh, for uh, uh, running tasks, Fargate, Glue for uh, uh, ETL and data, uh, data movement and, and, and pre-processing, DynamoDB, SNS, SQS, and also SageMaker to uh, start, for example, or coordinate the, the training of a, or the update of a machine learning model. So this is quite interesting. Uh, if you know how step functions work, you normally have an, a, a task that is an ARN, an Amazon resource name, and we created magic ARN for those services that you can use to say uh, this step of the step function is writing data on DynamoDB or is starting a, a, an AWS batch. Is AWS Blue ready for production? AWS Blue is ready for production. We added lots of features and uh, if you... Uh, at scale. At scale. <laughs> scale is... It, it depends on how, on how you use it. So uh, in, in, internally it's using technologies similar to Spark. So there are limits uh, in the technology, uh, but uh, I've, been, I've seen customers using it at very large scale, uh, but it depends on how you process the data and which kind of uh, manipulation you are doing on the data. Like if you want to group data and you have a very large data set, then it can be tough. Uh, maybe using a streaming uh, uh, interface can be more efficient. It, it depends on your use case. But uh, it's definitely a, a very interesting product uh, so maybe we can chat and see what, what's your problem and see if it's been solved. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah but there are you know, uh, some physical limits uh, like the speed of light, and in, in this case, it can be memory, for example. Uh, so, uh, It, 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 it looks strange to me uh, because I've seen customer using a very large scale. It can have limits because as I said, you can easily say to glue, take this data from S3 and group it uh, in this way, but then if it's too much for the memory of the working node, it will not work. So there are limits uh, and you can encounter those limits. Uh, normally there are different approach for this kind of large scale, uh, scale solution. <coughs> Yeah? Sorry, I, I don't understand what the strength is of such function. So, uh, it, it, so in the task. So what happens is that uh, with sub function, you normally uh, have a state machine where each step has a task uh, uh, or other things that are internal stuff. So the task normally is a lambda function or an external activity. Now as a task, you can give call each of these services and then uh, since this, uh, each step has a JSON payload, you can add parameters that are specific for that uh, uh, operation. So for example, you, if you want to start uh, AWS Batch, there is uh, some start API that requires some parameters. Now you can have a step that says the ARN of the task is this magic ARN that is linked to Batch. That is normally something like ARN, lots of uh, double dots, dots, and then you have the, the name of the service. And then you have parameters where you give the exact parameters that AWS Batch needs to, 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 needs to start a batch processing. So normally this is an asynchronous operation, so you need to poll to see when the batch ends. This is handled by step function. So what happens, you, you call it, and then the step will wait for uh, AWS Batch to finish this activity, and then we'll give you back the response, uh, and then you can go to the next step uh, without having to poll the service. Uh, and this is where you have large asynchronous activities like batch or tasks that you run on ECS. Uh, or you can have small granular activities where you just need to store data on DynamoDB and you don't want to create a Lambda function just to do that. Okay, hello. Would they all need to be in the same availability, availability zone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, uh, this works at region level. Oh. So uh, step function is storing the step and executing the step across uh, all the availability zone in the region. And those services are either multi-region by design or you can design them to be multi-region. So for example, ECS, you design the cluster. When you create the cluster, you must spread the, the, the nodes of the cluster that are EC2 instances or using Fargate across uh, multiple, uh, multiple availability zones. Uh, we also uh, saw lots of customers struggling with managing Kafka. So we now have, a, 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 this is in preview now, a managed version of, uh, of Kafka that we will handle for you. Uh, it doesn't require any code change. It's just the idea of removing the heavy lifting of managing Kafka and focusing on, on the features that you want to build. It's designed to be highly available across multi-availability zones. And, uh, and it, it, we will automatically update with rolling updates so you, you don't have a, to handle that and there's no uh, interruption during the updates. So this is you now Kafka that has lots of like Zookeeper, all these internal parts that are not very easy to, to manage and keep alive, so we do everything for you. You can focus on the main interfaces of the streaming, uh, of using streaming with Kafka. Uh, I don't think we disclose all the internals, but I, I'm assuming that Ah, there is the keeper, so, but it, it, it's a, it, as far as I know, it's really managing the traditional Kafka for you. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that we may do some specific changes over time if we need some customization to, to make it more easier. Normally we do changes and if it makes sense, we also release that to the open source community. Uh, we do that, for example, for Redis and other fully managed services. Yes. No, 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 it's multi-availability zone by design. I think you can choose, but it, it, uh, normally you choose to distribute across multiple availability zones. And that's what also what we use for rolling up, rolling up grades. So we do like one, uh, one node of the cluster across different availability zones at a time. Okay. 
so uh, this is something that we would be really, really interested in, um, that um, at the moment it seems you don't support encryption. Is there any update on when encryption will be available for? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why it's in preview. Uh, uh, managing encryption at scale is, is slightly different than managing for your private node. Uh, we also had the same problem with Neptune. Uh, and I can't share a roadmap. Uh, my, uh, since it's in preview, so I will not use it for production workload. It's the time where you can start playing with it, provide feedback like this, and probably if you're a, a Kafka expert, you will find lots of feedback to provide to the team. And this is really the time to do that because they can do breaking change before the GA will be announced. I, I, I didn't do a comparison. I think what we expect is that this will be much cheaper than running Kafka by yourself, considering also the engineering time uh, that you need to put on top of that. Does it have all of the features uh, compatible with the Confluent app? Uh, what messages are you encouraging for with that web API? So as far as I know, I'm not a Kafka expert. It really requires zero code changes, and that's the target for the services. So if you want to do a, a quick test, with the preview and you find that we are breaking something that would make it difficult to move your workload to this managed version, then just tell us because the idea is to have zero code changes on your side. Okay, so I think after this we're getting, so this was the main serverless announcement from, uh, uh, from Werner and databases, oh yeah, we have databases. Uh, because we changed the order uh, for this session, so that, that's making problems. So as you know, we have a broad portfolio of databases. This was before reInvent, so relational databases with RDF, with uh, uh, commercial and open source engines, with Aurora, the engine that we created that is compatible with MySQL and Postgres. And also we have for uh, NoSQL, we have DynamoDB that can be used for key value uh, scenarios or also for docu as a documentary-oriented database. Uh, in-memory store with Elastic Cache that supports Memcache and Redis, and the graph database that we announced last year, uh, that's uh, Neptune. So what, what we were feeling that was missing here. So first we launched, uh, last year we launched multi-master and serverless for Aurora, parallel query, uh, the possibility to backtrack a database to any point in time with Aurora, so we are innovating a lot there. Uh, for DynamoDB, we launched last year global tables and the possibility to do backup and point in time restore for DynamoDB tables, and Neptune was made available. So this year, we focused uh, on Aurora. Aurora is the foundation for the relational uh, database in our perspective. Uh, if you don't know how Aurora works, I suggest you to watch maybe a session from reInvent. Uh, the, basic, the, the, the basic idea is to uh, create a more intelligent storage that is a multi-tenant storage that all customers are using that is replicated six times across three availability zones. Uh, and uh, this layer is not just a storage, it actually talks uh, with database, it expects database logs that are being shipped by the compute layer. So this different way of separating the compute layer of a database with the storage, making the storage much smarter, is getting database logs, like something like a group of transaction is making lots of different things uh, possible. And uh, uh, so I think this was here. So, so this, uh, this year we launched now the global database, so you can now, I, I'm not sure if it's already available, it's in preview, but you can now create database, global databases with Aurora across multiple regions. So we can't fight the speed of light, but we can create uh, a database that is automatically replicated with normally less than a second uh, across multiple regions. So we don't expect this to be used like maybe active-active with, without any check because we can't do check uh, with that latency, uh, but it can be a very use case for replication for uh, across region for uh, uh, disaster recovery, for example, because uh, everything is automatically replicated uh, with less than one second and the database is there ready to take the workload if you need it. And it can be used in, the, in specific use case, if, for example, if you partition your users so that each user is working on one of the two at a time and then the difference is replicated across, uh, across regions. So it can be a very interesting use case. Something similar to what we were already doing with DynamoDB is now available for a fully uh, relational database, for a full relational database like Amazon Aurora. And this is one of the two uh, uh, 
couple of announcements on database for me because I really like DynamoDB. So one announcement that didn't make it to the keynote uh, is transactions. So now DynamoDB supports transactions across multiple items that can be also in multiple tables in the same account and in the same region. So how that works, you basically have a statement where you say, do this write, and you can provide a list of up to 10 writes or, and with uh, optional conditional checks. And this can be, uh, this will be done all together if the, all the conditions are met across multiple tables uh, inside a region. So it's, it's quite powerful. I think it's the only NoSQL database that provides this uh, level of transactions. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's already in the, in the SDK, so you can apply and experiment with transactions. The second announcement is this one. So uh, what we call DynamoDB on demand. So normally Dyna DynamoDB uh, works with capacity. So you need to say how many reads and how many writes per second you want to do on any table, and we provision the, uh, the capacity for you. Uh, now we launch this possibility to, create, to set a table with uh, on demand capacity. And that means that you're not paying by the throughput, but you're actually paying by the number of the reads and the writes. And you can scale immediately from zero to thousands and thousands of writes and reads per second without any provisioning on your side. Uh, so it, this makes truly uh, serverless DynamoDB. Uh, and uh, if, you have, uh, uh, if you have workloads with spikes, uh, this is probably extremely convenient for you. If you're just experimenting as well, it can be very convenient. I think the cost in, in US East is something like $1.25 for 1 million of writes, to give you an idea. So if you use it for testing, you, you're not paying basically nothing. And uh, if you want to, if you compare the pricing, uh, if you have a very stable workload and then you can go with your provisioning close to your actual workload, then the provisioning throughput can be cheaper. Uh, if you don't, if it's difficult to predict the, the, the workload, how much it grows, then you can use this and it's probably the best option. And speaking of workloads, do you get a bit of workload scaling out of this? Uh, so I, I did a test that is in my blog post. I started 1000 Lambda function doing, uh, I think, uh, launching each of those 100 requests in parallel to DynamoDB. So I reached from zero without any ramp up. Uh, 5,000 reads and writes per second, and then after 60 seconds, I shut down and, and, and it just finishes. So uh, technically, there are no limits, uh, but if you're in the range of the thousands of the transactions, there are absolutely no limits. Then maybe we need to, to do something under the hood, uh, but uh, if you look at your limits, so every, every account has actually a throughput limit for DynamoDB. If you don't need to increase that limit, you probably can use all your capacity here. If you need to increase that limit, then you get in touch with us and then we will tell you if we need to pr do something on, on, for the on-demand side. But within your limit, you can use it at uh, full capacity. It's incredibly fast. A customer was talking yesterday on Twitter that they migrated 7,000 documents on DynamoDB in 1.5 seconds uh, with uh, on capacity. And you can migrate tables from uh, provisioned mode to capacity and back uh, once per day. So you can do that if you want, and then if you want to come back, you, you can do that. Actually, to come back, you can come back whenever you want. From on-demand to provision it, we have a limit of once per day. So you can use that for uh, existing table very easily. Uh, time series is another topic where we've seen lots of customers asking for solution because the time series database are either expensive or very complex to set up. Normally, this is useful for click stream of uh, data for IoT uh, scenarios. Also, more recently for DevOps data, where DevOps, they want to collect all the information that they receive in real time and understand and, and process this information that they receive from all the systems that they manage. And uh, of course, we introduce uh, Amazon TimeStream is a fully managed time series database. It's designed to be serverless so that you don't need to care about scaling the database and it can grow to very high throughput and it's uh, much, much cheaper, especially to relational databases, because what we've seen is lots of customer, instead of using a complex time series database, they fall back on trying to use a relational database for this scenario, and it's complex and expensive. So if you move something that you have uh, on a relational database that is a time uh, series, it's much, much, much better. Uh, blockchain, well, why not? So there are two uh, use cases that we look as interesting. 
uh, so customers normally they want to have ledgers when they want to verify with a central trust all the changes of something uh, or we have a transaction uh, that should happen when there is not a central authority so when the, there is a decentralized trust uh, so what we of course this is not easy to, to, to solve so we have two different needs what we can do we launch two services for the centralized ledger, we have the Amazon Quantum Ledger Database, probably the coolest name for an AWS service uh, yet. Uh, this is actually based on an internal database that we use for, the, uh, uh, for some AWS services like EC2. So it's a technology that we created internally. And this is uh, creating a cryptographically verifiable transaction log for everything that is updated on the database. So if you need a central trust of that is immutable, uh, the, that everything that is changing for any update, this is the, the way to go. Uh, if you need to delete data, you can't do that here. So if for GDPR scenarios, think that is probably not the best use case, but uh, other than these scenarios where you need to delete, it can be very useful. And uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain, uh, this, is, this can help you have a fully managed Hyperledger fabric or a, a Ethereum uh, uh, blockchain. Uh, and of course, it's much easier to set up. And then you can move data between the blockchain to the QLDB uh, for, uh, for uh, further analysis. Uh, so the database scenario is, has grown and it's covering much more interesting use cases. Machine learning, I'm accelerating, otherwise it will be very late. Uh, machine learning, lots of customers are doing machine learning. Uh, we need to do something different, otherwise the, the logos will not be visible next year. Uh, and <laughs> This is how we see customers can use machine learning. So on, on the bottom, we have the machine learning frameworks and the infrastructure that you need to, sup need to support them like GPU power at instances. Uh, then there are platforms uh, like SageMaker that make the use of these frameworks much easier for skilled developers or uh, uh, data scientists. And then fully managed AI services that any developer can use that solve specific use case like vision, chatbot, speech, and languages. So what we, on, on the infrastructure, uh, this is uh, what we launched. Uh, we launched a new instance, it's called P3DN, and uh, basically is doubling, the, is using the 100 gigabit networking, so it's very good for simulation and need tight networking like fluido dynamics, uh, and it's doubling the memory uh, on the GPU card uh, that we have inside, so it's allowing much more interesting use cases. Uh, and this is interesting for because, for example, TensorFlow is mostly used on AWS. Uh, for example, those are customers that are uh, using this instance now that is available. And uh, we also improve uh, how TensorFlow scales. So normally TensorFlow has some limits in scaling, and we worked with an AWS optimized version that is using the technology from the P3 instances so that the scaling is much better. And this means that also training is much better. So the, a 30 minute uh, training time from some company based in Mountain Dew, uh, it can now be run in Seattle in 14 minutes. Uh, yeah, and we don't use specialized hardware, we use the standard NVIDIA cards that we use in the P3 instances. No, this is not a blockchain because it's, there's not distributed trust. So a, block, uh, a, uh, <coughs> a ledger database is basically, the idea is that you have a central authority, so the database has a central authority, uh, but any update is signed cryptographically so that if you see any record, you can check, start from the record and all the updates back to the root of the database to be sure that uh, nothing has been compromised. Uh, so it's useful if you need to store information and you want to be sure that nobody is updating the information uh, under the hood. So it's not a blockchain. And it's something that we already use because when customer call us and tell us something happened on EC2, we must be sure to rebuild all the history of what happened for this EC2 instance. So we use it for some services to trace all the, the changes that customers do. And we thought that this tech technology can be also helpful for customers. So it's not a blockchain, it's a ledger uh, database with central authority. So the minimum, because it eliminates many use cases for blockchain, which is complicated. 
Yeah, as I said at the beginning, there are two main the use cases, the centralized one and the distributed one. So with the uh, quantum ledger database, I think we solved all, most of the centralized trust-based uh, use cases. But, but the other one? So the other one is a traditional blockchain, so. But it's not decentralized, it is. It's decentralized. Uh, so we, we fully manage them, but the, I, I, I think you can uh, connect nodes on top of that. So the problem with a blockchain is creating the core infrastructure of the blockchain, and then you want to connect more nodes on top of that. Uh, can you take your node and connect it to the public uh, Ethereum blockchain? That I don't know. Uh, do so, uh, so which uh, so we we support uh, Ethereum. Uh, uh, and and yeah, so I think this is, yeah, I, I'm not sure if you can connect them, but I, uh, to the to the global one. I would assume yes, I would assume yes, I would assume yes, but I, I didn't di deep dive on this service. So if if you reach to me afterwards, maybe I can, I can double check. So inference, so when we do my machine learning, we always talk about building the model, but then using the model and making the inference can be where most of the costs are. So uh, it's difficult to solve two solutions here. First, uh, Amazon Elastic Inference is the possibility to connect as much power as you want for inference to any instance type. So you don't need to use a GPU powered instance, but you can use a cheap M5 large instance, and then you can connect uh, the petaflops that you need uh, to, the, to the instance, uh, teraflops actually, I think, uh, uh, based on, uh, on what you need. And this new Elastic uh, inference interface goes from one teraflops to 32 teraflops, and you can connect to any instance type, uh, any, I think there's a list of supported one, but it's quite broad. And then can be used uh, by, uh, instantly by frameworks like TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch. So it can make very much cheaper, because you can uh, in, uh, probably save 75% uh, on running inference with a very low latency because if you run inference without a GPU on an M5 instance, it's very slow. You s often need to go for a GPU powered instance to keep the latency uh, below maybe uh, 200 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. In this way, you can do that with very much ist uh, cheap e instances. Uh, but what happens if you need lots of power? Uh, then we created the uh, AWS Inferencia. This is a a uh, new chip that we custom developed to run inference uh, at scale. So it's very high throughput and low latency. And this is a pre-announcement, so it's still not available. Uh, and the idea is that in this way you can connect this uh, custom-made chip to do inference at scale uh, uh, in a much more efficient way. So moving up on the next layer, SageMaker. For SageMaker, SageMaker is solving lots of the issues that you have when you want to create and, 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 and use a machine learning model. Lots of customers are using it. Uh, and one of the problem is how can I find good data to do my machine learning training? Because if I want to create a self-driving car, I need to have labeled data with all the information that I can use to train a model that will recognize a car uh, from a pedestrian. And we launched uh, SageMaker Ground Truth. This is a way to provide uh, raw data, and then we can either automatically or manually label this data uh, for uh, creating the, the uh, data set for running uh, a supervised uh, learning uh, machine learning model. Uh, you can use human annotations using mechanical Turk, or if your data is sensitive, you can have a private group uh, within your company that can do the annotation, for, uh, on, for example, on images and then we will create the training data that then you can use. Ground truth, so for having good labeled data is the main problem of supervised learning now. So we are trying to help companies have that publicly or privately. Uh, we added lots of algorithms, but uh, now we think uh, we, want, we open machine learning algorithms uh, to, the mach to the marketplace. So if you are looking for specific algorithm or train models that we don't have, now that can be provided by a partner. For example, there's a partner who has a machine learning vision model for recognizing the, the, the make and the year and the model of a car. So if you have this specific use case, instead of training your business model, you can go on the marketplace and then uh, pay for the, the use of this model. And this is a market, so lots of companies are, uh, and if you are a data scientist and you want to create and sell your own algorithms or your own trained model on top 
of those algorithms. Uh, this is a good time because the marketplace here is starting and, uh, and there's lots of features to protect the intellectual property of what you're selling. So the customer will be able to use the algorithms of the model but not to access the internals that is your intellectual property. Uh, supervised and unsupervised learning is where lots of things happened in the recent years, but now there's lots of focus on reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is when you have a dynamic environment and you want to train something to win and reach some specific goal, like uh, be good at Pac-Man or to be a, a good self-driving car in a dynamic world. And that's why we added uh, the capabilities to do reinforcement learning very easily now in SageMaker. Uh, uh, and to make it even easier, uh, we also create a, a physical product. The Deep Racer is a, a small model of a car that has a camera, an engine, and you can train a model for self-driving car, and you can uh, and you can uh, uh, and you can then uh, uh, test it on a on a playground. Actually, we have a a, a deep uh, a deep racer here. Uh, it's here on the front, maybe. This is the, uh, the cover, and this is the naked version. It's ba there's basically an Intel processor, there is a camera, uh, and uh, the possibility to deploy the model here. Is and part of the uh, no, unfortunately, no. That was. Uh, uh, <laughs> they are on sale on Amazon.com. Uh, they are starting, they are on pre sales on Amazon.com. Actually, can we just talk about what actually happened with gentlemen? Ah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Look, can you? Come on, you, you <laughs> what you've done is absolutely, utterly amazing, yeah? Woo! Can you just go give these guys a two minute chat about what you did at reInvent? So it's still a bit fuzzy. Um, What's your name? Rick, so my name's Rick Fish, um, work here in London. Um, so we went to reInvent, uh, it's my first reInvent, uh, took four members of my team, uh, and we entered the um, Deep Racer competition, which was an accelerated competition in 2018, it was tw over 22 hours just to test out a model on a track, uh, which was down at the MGM Speedway, they called it. Um, yeah, so, so we all got a chance to play with one of these. Uh, we went to a workshop where we had 20 minutes to upload a model onto these, um, and then just give it a go on a track, and largely we fluked it, <laughs> I mean, to be fair. Uh, we got uh, the second fastest time uh, in the heat, uh, and that was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and so we, we, we thought, by the evening, somebody would have way beaten us by then. Uh, but we got the text from the, the, the kind of general manager of, of um, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, uh, to say, you've qualified. Can you be at backstage by 6.15 tomorrow morning? Uh, I was down Fremont Street in a casino at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I said, well, if I do need to do that, I need to sort of go home now and get some sleep, uh, which I did. Um, and then, yeah, we rocked up backstage. Uh, there was three finalists. Uh, we put the cars on the track, um, and we, we sort of did the final race, and we were victorious. Um, so, Bravo. there we go. Uh, and so I've, I've brought the winning car home here for the UK, you know, good on UK engineering. Um, and we've got five other cars being shipped to the UK. Well, sorry, four other cars being shipped to the UK at the moment. They're being FedExed, and one to New York uh, for our team there. So... Great fun and just great to play with. Unfortunately, the workshop IDs have now expired, so we're, we're on the preview and we want to get back on there because we need to go back next year and retain the trophy, <laughs> um, which we're actively registered at jigsawracing.xyz, which is our company, um, just in case we want to sort of pivot the company into a racing team. So there we go. Well, thanks so much. Round of applause for the <laughs> fastest deep race of winnings on the planet. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Thank you. And actually, we want everybody to play with the deep racer and understand how reinforcement learning works. That's why we launched the deep racer league. Uh, so it's uh, the first global autonomous racing league open to anyone. And we are planning uh, uh, lots of events next year, also when there are global summits. So uh, I, I can't do any anticipation for London, but I would expect that we will have it in London. So uh, uh, we can do a check maybe for the next user group. Uh, when the planning of the summits. But I know that for almost all the big global summits, we are planning to, uh, to run a race with the cards. And the idea is that everybody that will win those races or will be in the top time for those uh, races will be invited to reinvent where we will have the final 
next year in 2019. And this was a lot of, lots of fun, definitely. So the reinforcement learning was, uh, is done actually in the simulator. So you are, we have a simulator and it's also part of another announcement that I still have to do, uh, where you can simulate and, 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 and the car can uh, learn. Uh, normally with self-driving car, you don't want to learn in the physical world because it can be too hard and costly. So you do that in a simulator. And then when you are satisfied with the model, with the learning of your model, you can deploy the model on, on the, on the, on the car and test it on the physical world. So that's the idea. I don't think I have the slide here, but the idea is that the train, you don't do the training on the physical world. And uh, moving to the high level services, what we launched, well, recommendation is something that we've always been asked. So how can I build product service film recommendation in an easy way? We now have a, a fully managed service, it's called Amazon Personalize, that will help you cover all the, uh, the steps from loading the data, inspecting the data, choosing the right algorithm, and train the model, and then host the model to create real-time uh, personal uh, recommendation for your products, your services, or whatever you are interested to. Uh, another topic that we've been asked a lot to help is forecasting, and in fact, StageMaker forecasting algorithms are one of the most used ones. Uh, so we now created a fully managed service for time series forecasting. Uh, so if you need to forecast sales, revenues, uh, the stock of your uh, warehouses, how many energy you will need uh, at some point to do something. Uh, this is all that uh, anything that you can do. So you need good uh, historical data. Uh, and then we, we, uh, we implement multiple uh, algorithms uh, and we can also help you to choose automatically which algorithm to use with your data and create the model and then you can use forecasting as a service uh, with your API. It works, you put your data on S3, you can also automatically schedule uh, re-update of the model like every hour or every day or every week and we will handle everything for you when you get the endpoint to run forecasting. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting service. With Redshift, uh, I know that the integration is, is planned for the time, for time stream, the time series database, because we expect time series to be there, but um, we look, yeah, yeah, it, it, it makes sense. Definitely there's S3, so it's not, S3 is probably the not most natural interface to output data from Redshift, so you can build it very easily already. Uh, documents is something where we got lots of requests, so now, I'm launch Amazon Textract, the possibility to extract information from text documents. So if you have scanned uh, documents, we can extract the text, but we don't want just to extract a bunch of characters. So we analyze the text, recognize if there are multiple columns, if there are tables. You can also tag the text so we extract the information and load the information on a database for you. So if you have forms, so it's quite uh, powerful. So if you have legacy text or any text that you want to digitalize, it's a, it's a great feature. And I think, and all of those services are integrated with the uh, AWS ecosystem, so to S3, Kinesis, and other services. So I think the uh, machine learning platform uh, is really expanding from the infrastructure to the platform to the high level services. And last section, IoT. So this is the current space of IoT before reInvent, sorry. Uh, so in the cloud, uh, running in the, on the edge. Uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of everything here, but I think we don't have time to, to do a full IoT session. So what we launch at reInvent, AWS IoT site-wise, uh, it runs on the edge, and the idea is to make it easy to collect and organize data from industrial equipment. So we think that if you have a factory where you want to do, do for example, Industry 4.0, you want to collect information from industrial da uh, devices that speaks low level, speak low level protocols, this is designed to interact with that kind of devices and collect the information pro and process on the site, uh, the information for you, and also send the data to the cloud if you want to do further processing. Then, uh, AWS IoT things graph, the way you can graphically develop IoT application and then you can deploy at the edge, so you can graphically design uh, the workflow of what your IoT application must do with the events, so connect the sensor and the actuators with the data processing. And then uh, AWS IoT events is designed to simplify the way you can respond to events, 
So uh, the idea is that now if you want to respond to events, you need to create some sort of backend using Lambda functions, but we see IoT customer, they want to something very easy to use. So this is really a platform design where you can say, if I receive this kind of event, for example, from my factories, then I need to start this kind of action. It's very easy to do this kind of setups. And uh, robotics, why not? No, we did blockchain. Uh, robotics is something else where uh, lots of customers asking us to help. So we launched AWS RoboMaker, the possibility to develop, test, and deploy robotics applications. Uh, so we created a cloud extension to ROS. Uh, ROS is the most common open source uh, operating system for uh, robotics. Uh, we created a development environment based on Cloud9, a simulation environment where you can simulate virtually what is happening with your robotic application and then you can manage a fleet of robots and deploy uh, over the air the, the, the application on those robots. And uh, oh, sorry, I spoke. So if you want to play with this, there is, uh, you can, if you, even if you don't have robots, you can reach this point online. So, uh, so it's quite cool. Uh, you only, it's based on Cloud9, so the only cost you have is the EC2 instance that we start for running your simulation, your development environment, and there is a cost for simulations. So it's, if you want to play a little bit with it, it's, it's quite cool. And then after robots, what else? <laughs> the space. So lots of customers have the issue of uh, receiving data from satellites. Uh, so we created AWS ground station so you can very easily uh, re request immediately or book uh, in advance in time access to satellites. We currently started with two ground stations in Oregon and I think in Sydney, Australia, but we want to grow to 12 ground stations and we will give you the, the space, uh, the time slots into this ground station to connect to satellites and receive data or send the data uh, to those satellites. And those, the data will be collect, connected with your VPC or your S3 bucket so you can store the data easily or process the data easily. So this was another use case that was launched at reInvent. And uh, if you want to see the whole list, because probably we forgot something, this is the almost invisible because of the color URL uh, where you can find all the announcements. It was the page that uh, Rick was showing at the beginning. And if you want to join the conversation, we have a Slack channel for developers where we talk about containers, serverless, Kubernetes, community uh, development and anything else. So we're happy if you, if you want to join. Thank you.